Can you hear all right in the back? You fellows are sitting in the back row. Can you hear with the air conditioning and all? You can hear us sufficiently. Well, I just returned from a class that uh, Brother Bob and Lanny taught, and uh, I want to say how much I uh, appreciate their presentation. I feel a little guilty about standing up here. I looked around the room while I was there, and it's all the elders there. And, you know, I was the only one in that room that had a suntan. And uh, uh, it made me feel just a little bit uneasy to get up here before you all. Uh, one of the ladies in the congregation uh, last Sunday complimented me on the, uh, on the announcements that I made. And then she said, Brother, uh, you have a, a, a very good suntan, and it's very becoming. But I knew what she was getting to. She knew I liked to play golf. And uh, she's wondering maybe if I was playing a little too much golf and neglecting the flock. So I said, uh, Sister Smith, if I could prove to you that this was a spiritual uh, suntan, uh, if it was found in the Word, would, you be, would that be all right? And she said, certainly. I said, well, you know, we're supposed to walk in the light as he's in the light. Uh, we're supposed to be shepherds, uh, and I have to get out and follow the flock around. They're outside a lot during the summer. And then I said, would you turn to number page number 280 in our songbook, and we sang together, Walking in the Sunlight. And uh, I said, is it all right if I carry a golf club along the way? And she agreed that it was. So, uh, <laughs> so we got that all settled. Well, anyway, I'm Hollis Sears. I'm an elder from the Bloomington, Indiana, the North Central Congregation. I am here with uh, Brother Jeff Hill, who's our campus minister, and Oliver Rogers, who is our pulpit evangelist. Our topic... Uh, is partners in the gospel. I just like to say in the beginning that I think that is the most valuable, important partnership that we could ever have. Whether you're in government, in athletics, in business, this is a partnership that's going to last here, not only here, but through eternity. And fellows and brothers, let's make the best of that partnership that we have here on earth. I'd like to ask the question, why are you here? Why, why are all of you here? And I suppose most of you would answer the question because of God's grace. But also, that is a gift to us, but we find another gift mentioned in Ephesians 4. Would you all turn to Ephesians 4 with me, please? And verse 11. And his gifts... And we're talking about Christ, and his gifts were that sh some should be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the cunning of men, by the craftiness and deceitful wiles. Then it goes on to speak of things speaking about the truth. All of us here who are evangelists, we know that we certainly there's no prophets or apostles, although that office is, the authority of that office is still in effect. But we are evangelists and we are pastors. And we've been given a gift by Christ. We've been given the ability. Uh, we, of course, we've accepted this by our own uh, motivation. Those who are pastors, we've been given this opportunity by the congregation that we serve. So this is a great gift, and it's how we use that gift and how we form this partnership that I believe that's why you're here at Columbia, Missouri on August the 2nd, and you're here at the Ramada Inn uh, approximately three o'clock. So I would like to uh, direct our thinking about this partnership and to tell you something about the church uh, which I'm an elder of. Uh, we have ten elders in our congregation and you wonder, well now why do we have ten elders? Uh, you certainly must be all pretty old and pretty inefficient and pretty slow. And I think uh, we can uh, say that all three of those things we might qualify. We have a couple men who are 82 I think 81 or 82. Uh, they're 
possibly getting ready to step down. We have five that are probably older. They're elder elders. And then we have some men who are 35, like I am. And uh, <laughs> we have some young fellows. And we have the, also our eldership are made up of a bank president, an engineer, an oral surgeon, a dentist, uh, business people. They're made up of some who are uh, work by the hour. Uh, but when we go into a meeting or when we serve, we take off that cloak. We're no longer businessmen. We're no longer bank presidents. We're no longer dentists. We're no longer oral surgeons. We're no longer uh, a uh, owner of a grocery chain. We're servants of this congregation. When we go into meeting, we have a meeting every Monday night with Jeff and Oliver and Steve, our three ministers. When we go into that room, you know, there's not a senior minister there. Oliver's been there 13 years. Uh, Steve Sachs has been there two years. Jeff's been there four. We don't exalt one above the other. We don't exalt one elder above the other. An elder's been an elder for 40 years. He has no preeminence over any of us. We're all there together. We meet. There's 13 men that sit down to discuss and plan the spiritual outlook, the, the, the plans for the church. And, let, and I, I like to say this in the beginning, that, you know, it's hard to get two men to agree, but we have 13 men that are all in accord by the time we leave that room. It may not happen at first, but we stay there until every man agrees. And that's because we put our pride aside, we put our egos of pride aside, we put our seniority aside, we've taken off this cloak, we're servants. And that's why we consider ourselves servants and to bring about this partnership but to do this we have to have one mo uh, we have to have goals and we have as a goal and I think that every congregation every church uh, their principal goal should be to preach the gospel to save the lost and to above all things have this unity that we read about in Ephesians 4 all right, how are some of the practical ways that we bring this about? How do we establish this close relationship between the minister, the campus minister, the youth minister, the pulpit minister, and the elders? Well, as I said, we, we, de we, we take off these cloaks of pride and ego and our positions in life. We get together. And I think one of the most important things that we're doing right now, we have one meeting that we pray. We're there for two hours and we pray together. Oliver prays for Jeff. Jeff prays for Oliver. I pray for Jeff. We have, we, they're, they're not generalized prayers, not, uh, you know, sometimes we say, well, I have a word of prayer and that's what we have. It's just a word of prayer. You know, sometimes prayers are like a long distance phone call. You know, we're calling up God, but we're sitting there, you know, waiting for the three minutes to be up. Uh, reminds me of the story of uh, or my wife's uncle who was over in Germany during the Second War and they'd saved up their money to call him over there and, and uh, so they said, now we can't talk over three minutes and uh, we've got to figure out what we're going to say. And by the time they got him on the phone, they were all so excited. Uh, her, they elected her grandmother to talk first and she said, uh, well, how's the weather over in Germany? See, they've been waiting all this year all about the war and I think that's what we do with God. We call up and say, well, how's the weather up there? That's all we've got to say. But after you come from that meeting and you've heard these prayers, these sincere prayers for one another, we've, we pray for the congregation. We individually, collectively, we pray for each other individually, collectively, the things that are on our heart. And when you do that, you can't help but have a partnership, this close relationship that we have. What else do the elders do? to have this close relationship, this partnership with the ministers and with the congregation. We're always in meetings, and sometimes we're criticized for this because we're having meetings, meetings, meetings. We meet maybe five times a week. Sometimes we're there almost every night. The church building is busy every night. I want to say that, that when you drive by the North Central Church of Christ, uh, it's on a corner here and the football stadium's over here and the basketball arena is over there. 
and that's the most popular spot in Bloomington. You look right across and you see that steeple. And I'll have to say that when we first moved over there, there were a lot of nights that, chur a lot of nights that, that ch church building was dark. There were a lot of days when you only saw the preacher's car there. But now you can go by that lot and there may be 20 cars there during the day. There's a lot of activity. There's a lot of effort be going on. At night, there's the youth groups meeting, the college students are meeting, the singles are meeting. The, there may be a, a dinner for the, the senior citizens. There may be, I mean, this, uh, the Bible call program, the benevolence committee, there's somebody meeting, and we're having meetings. But don't criticize the elders if they're having meetings, if they're communicating. And that's the one thing I want, want to emphasize, that to communicate, each elder communicate with each other, each elder communicate with members, the leaders of your congregation. Communicate with your campus minister. Jeff and I have a meeting each week. We have a lunch meeting each week. Oliver and I get together. Uh, the elders get together. Uh, we're together all the time. We get to know each other. We get to establish these relationships, which we have to have to have this partnership. The elders meet with a zone chairman. We have our congregation divided up in zones. Uh, also, the elders meet with all new members of the congregation. That's very important. We take two Sundays a month where we just designate times that we go to the church building. We invite people who've just been baptized. We sit down. We get acquainted with them. They get acquainted with us. They ask questions. Uh, maybe there's something on their mind. We get to know those people. And it takes two Sundays, afternoons a month to do that. But we do that. Just last Sunday, we had a, uh, a meeting with a, uh, an ethicist, a doctor that's in anesthesiology, and his wife. We had a meeting with a, a lady who was 91 years old from Russia, Gabriel Stankovich, who had just baptized. 91 years old, and her and her mother, I mean her daughter rather, her mother, I don't think we met with her mother. <laughs> uh, so you see we're constantly meeting. Uh, we have a, a sponsorship program where all the students are sponsored by an adult family. Uh, they're invited into their homes. Uh, there's a Valentine party. There's uh, uh, all these relationships that develop for that. The elders have a dinner. Uh, especially for the uh, for evangelists, for Jeff and Steve and Oliver, where we show our appreciation. Uh, we just ha have this love one for another that we build up. Uh, the other thing besides communication, I just like to stress, and I think my time is about up here, is to be patient, one with the other. You know, we get a new campus minister in who's who's very uh, zealous. I remember the first time Jeff came in, I was on the reception committee to meet him, and uh, <clears throat> he was just coming in from Texas. He'd come by the way of Texas, and he walked across that parking lot, and he had those cowboy boots on and that uh, ten-gallon hat and that holster, <laughs> and uh, so we had to have a meeting right away. <laughs> And uh, I said, Jeff, you know, you're not in Texas now, and you got to get those sand out of your boots, and you got to kind of straighten up here and act like a Hoosier. And But another thing, he was an hour late. And here I'd been waiting there for him an hour late, and I said, Jeff, here you are the first day on the job, and you're an hour late. Well, he said, I just flew in from Texas, and I flew in by TWA, and I was riding on this plane, and I saw all these VIPs and executives, so I thought that would be a great place to get a Bible talk going. And I walked down that aisle and said, you know, we had a great soul talk going. And he said, it wasn't long until the pilot was there involved, and then the co-pilot. And I said, well, who was flying that plane? He said, well, they put it on automatic. And he said, that plane was just flying around and around and, and uh, while that soul talk was going on. So that was the greatest thing that uh, uh, had happened to him. So I said, okay, uh, that's fine. It's all right to be an hour late. But anyway, uh, you have to be patient. The elders have to be patient with one another. As I just mentioned, we all come from different backgrounds. We have different jobs. We have different positions. Uh, ministers have different backgrounds. They're different ages. Uh, Oliver is a little older and mature. He might act a little more slowly than Jeff. Uh, but 
we have to realize this. Steve is a little bit younger yet uh, in the work. So we have to take that in consideration. They have to consider that our maybe our 82-year-old elder when we go out to visit. We have one night that we also go out to visit our delinquent members. That if it was bad weather, he might not be able to go. Well, uh, Jeff has to be able to understand that he that, uh, it would be impossible for him to go. We have to put aside our egos, as I was mentioning. And it was, I, I just thank the Lord for this, that we were very fortunate when we had our, you see, for a long time, Oliver was there and he had center stage. He was our minister for, well, I guess, uh, probably nine or ten years when uh, Jeff came and Steve came. But it happens that Oliver doesn't have an ego, or he doesn't have pride. And when he came, he was willing to step a little bit off the of center stage, just a little bit, so Jeff could fit in here in the spotlight just a little bit. Then Steve came, our, uh, our youth minister, so Oliver stepped a little bit farther over so to make room for Steve. Now we have three of them in perfect harmony. We have ten elders in perfect harmony. And if you're ever going to have a unified congregation, they've got to see that you, all your elders, all your deacons, all of your uh, evangelists are unified. I don't care what kind of a program, where it's a uh, college program, your uh, senior citizens program, your bus ministry, your Bible call, in order for this to work, they've got to see that unity. Getting back to patience, patience isn't uh, uh, a license uh, for procrastination. A lot of times we think if we're patient, if the elders is patient, if they act or they're uh, reacting too slowly to this problem, that they're procrastinating. But that isn't true. We can find, I was going to, I don't have time, but read all the scriptures we have in the Bible about being patient. We have to be patient with, with another. And with the methods, you know, that's the one thing we're hung up on now in the brotherhood is methods. Be patient with someone else's method. Be flexible. You know, the program that works at Bloomington, Indiana might not work uh, up in Minnesota, or it might not work in, in uh, Louisiana. Uh, there's different people, there's different backgrounds. Uh, don't get hung up just on, on methods, but be flexible to use the method that will work in your neighborhood. I just remember a story that Oliver told me about uh, uh, methods of drinking out of a cup. Did you ever think that could be a problem, drinking out of a cup? Well, he's from Kentucky. He's an old Kentucky boy, and he likes his uh, collard greens and all this, and he likes to squirrel hunt. And uh, he was out squirrel hunting one day, and he got lost. And he was wandering around. It was about 90 degrees like it was here yesterday, and he, he wandered all day without a drink of water. And he was all scratched up and tired, and uh, he f up on the hill he could see a, a shack. And there was an old man that lived up there all by himself, and he finally stumbled his way up there, and he said, Could I just have a drink of water? So I've been out here in these woods all day and I've got chigger bites and blackberry briar scratches all over me. And I said, all I want is a drink of water. And the old man said, sure. And there was an old man sitting there with snaggled teeth and tobacco running down his cheek and, and barefooted. And he said, yeah, all right, help yourself. Oh, here's the bucket. So there was a rusty bucket and it had some flies on it, dead flies. He said, just skim those flies off and uh, just help yourself. And had a gourd there to drink of. And Oliver thought, well, I'm just as thirsty as I am. I can drink that water, but I just can't put that gourd up to mouth or that old man's uh, put his mouth or lips. So he, so he said, well, how will I do that? And he's, he got to thinking, well, what method would this man use to drink out of that gourd? And he said, well, I'm just sure he just takes it up and takes a drink. And Oliver said, well, I'll do it this way. He just took the, the gourd up and held it around like this and took a drink out of that took a big long drink and the old man jumped up and went over and shook his hand and he said, you know, I've been here 40, 50 years and you're the first man that I met that drinks out of a gourd just the way I do. <laughs> so there is, there is a, uh, the same thing we can do as far as methods. There's different methods. So, so don't be inflexible as far as methods. Karen. Be willing to change your views, elders, uh, ministers. Accept a new idea or proposal even though it didn't originate with you. 
and sometimes that's hard to do. And don't always expect to have instant results. Be willing to wait. And you fellows are just starting the campus ministry. Uh, if you didn't baptize 100 people last year, don't be discouraged. That's all going to come. Be willing to be patient. Uh, don't jump into things without uh, really thinking them through. And then another, I think one of the most important things for elders and ministers and evangelists is to be patient with those who criticize you. And if you're doing a good work and if you're getting a lot of results and if you're successful, uh, you're going to get criticized. And a lot of times it's over methods, it's over the ways you're going about it. But don't let that change your direction. Don't let that hinder this partnership that you've got in the gospel. Don't ever let that be a determining factor. Meet with the people who are criticizing. Talk with them. Talk it out. Meet them face to face. Don't get up in the pulpit and air your views by the pulpit, you fellows that are ministers. That's not the place. Don't, don't, don't lash out at somebody from the pulpit. And, and uh, elders, don't, don't do that from the pulpit. Don't do that from the bulletin. Uh, have a meeting. We're constantly having meetings with people. Anybody that wants to talk to us, and, and we're having a lot of meetings, because uh, I, I like to say that I think 95% of our people are behind all of our programs. They may be 5% that are not, that, we, that maybe we'll criticize. But we meet with those people. We talk to them. We try to be patient with them. And eventually, uh, they'll be one over to the truth. Just be patient, communicate, and love. Don't let, as uh, we heard this morning, don't let that first love uh, be forsaken. Thank you very much. While I'm getting some water here, let's see how many elders there are in the audience. Would you hold your hands up, please? Hey, that's great. I'm delighted to see that number. All right, how many uh, pulpit evangelists are there here? Let's see the hands of those. My fellows, what happened to us? We didn't get represented that well, did we? Okay, and the rest of your campus uh, evangelists, let's see your uh, hands and uh, the ladies too. You can hold up your hands. Okay, how many of you are training for the uh, for the campus ministry? Uh, quite a number. Okay, that's great. I, I got a little thirsty. <clears throat> that lunch was too good. Let me say that it's a real honor and a privilege for me to be here and participate on this program with a man like Hollis Sears. I have a great admiration and a great respect for this elder and for all of our elders for, as for that matter and for our campus evangelist, Brother Jeff Hill, and also for the young man who works with our youth, Steve Sykes. It's just a, a genuine delight for me to work with these gentlemen. And as Hollis has already pointed out, uh, it's essential that we are united. We must have unity in our work. And al along with that, of course, he's pointed out the importance of communication and patience. Now, you may find that we overlap some because I, he's coming at this from the standpoint of an elder, a shepherd. I'm coming at it from the standpoint of the pulpit evangelist. Uh, Jeff will be coming at it from the standpoint of the uh, campus ministry. All right, so if you find some overlapping, it's just because we're looking at it from our own point of view, and that won't hurt. But I think I can tell you this. There's probably not a congregation in the Brotherhood anywhere where there is uh, uh, more unity and uh, where the people really stand together. The congregation, they, especially the leadership, is behind one another. We are in agreement. Uh, we have unity. And I am grateful and thankful that I can say that, and I can stand up here and honestly know that I am telling you the truth when I say that. And so I'm thrilled and I'm glad and I'm excited to be able to work in a situation like that. Uh, and so one of the reasons that I'm here today is to tell you why I believe we have this unity and this harmony, uh, this agreement, as Hollis has pointed out. And I want to take a little time on that. But in addition to that, I also want to point out some areas where I think uh, we can improve, we can do better, and hopefully some things that will help you in your ministry, if you're already in it or if you're looking forward to getting in it. Because uh, let me tell you something, folks. If the leadership in a congregation can get along and do get along, the congregation will make it. Now, we may have problems at times, and we, sh we shall have. 
But if the leadership gets along, the congregation is going to be all right. It's when you have division and problems in your leadership that you are in difficulty. Now, you mark it down, and don't forget that. And that's one reason why I'm a little disappointed that the entire group here isn't able to hear this message today, what we have to present to you, because this is where we're having our problems in the brotherhood today. It begins in the leadership. Now, it uh, goes out from there, but make no mistake about it. When the leadership is unable to get along, we've got problems in the local congregation, and we'll have problems in the brotherhood. So you just be sure, sure of that. Let me tell you some reasons why I believe uh, we are successful at uh, Bloomington, Indiana, at North Central. First of all, we are in agreement on our goals. Hollis mentioned what those goals are. Number one, as we look at it, our primary goal is to carry the gospel to the entire world. We believe that it is our responsibility to first reach our own Jerusalem and then to go up from there and to multiply in every way that we can. So we are in agreement on that goal. We are also in agreement on a secondary goal, and that is while doing this, we must have unity, we must have harmony, and we must be in agreement uh, as we go about the work of carrying the message to all the world. Now, the second thing is this. We treat each other as Christians. You say, well, don't we all? No. As a matter of fact, we don't. And that's one of the reasons why I'm here today, and it's one of the reasons why this, this particular message is scheduled. We don't treat each other as Christians. And that's why we're having the problems in the brotherhood today that we do have. Uh, in uh, le Peter's letter, in 1 Peter, the first chapter in verse 22, you recall where he said, seeing that you have purified your heart in your obedience to the truth unto unfeigned or sincere love of the brethren, love one another from the heart firmly. We've had tremendous lessons on that this morning, and I'm grateful and I'm thankful for this. You know why that uh, I love Jeff Hill and Hollis Sears and all of our elders and the congregation where I work? is because, first of all, I am commanded to do that as a Christian, and secondly, because I want to. Because I want to. That's the only reason that I love these brethren, is because, really and truly, when you boil it down, I want to. Now, God has commanded that of you and me. He hasn't said that we have to agree on everything, but he has said that we are to love one another, and I don't have any choice in that. And you don't have any choice in that as a Christian. You may not find me the most compatible, compatible individual in all of the world, and there may be things about me you don't particularly like. But you are commanded as a Christian to love me, my friend and my brother and sister in Christ. You, that you are commanded to do. Now, we love one another. And because we love one another, we treat each other as Christians. And uh, because we treat each other as Christians, we get along. All right, I want to talk just a little bit about this matter of communication. This is the third point. Uh, Hollis talked about that. I want to say a little more about it. We have continuous and open communication in our congregation among the leaders, the elders, the uh, uh, pulpit evangelists, the campus evangelists, and our youth evangelists. We have continuous communication, and that is absolutely essential. Our elders leave the door open to us any time and all the time. We can go talk to them day or night whenever we want to. Uh, we don't have to wait till they have a, a call to meet, that rather their, special, their regular meeting in order to get with them. If we need to meet with the elders, if we have something we need to discuss, they are ready to call a meeting and get together for us to do that day or night and any time that is possible for them to do it. And I am thankful and grateful we have that kind of leadership, that we have that kind of elders. Now, that's not easy to do. You brethren out here who are shepherds and who have a job, that you work a full-time job, you know that's difficult. But they are just that kind of men. And that's the kind of dedication that we have to have if we're really going to get the job done and have uh, unity and agreement and harmony within the congregation. So they keep us informed, and we keep them informed in turn. We meet together, as Hollis mentioned, regularly. Uh, on a regular basis each month. We have our regular meetings. We have this meeting when we get together and we pray together. That to me is one of the most important meetings that we have with our leadership. That meeting when we get together, Hollis said two hours. We don't always finish in two hours. Sometimes we may go three hours praying. And we pray and we get down to business. And as Hollis pointed out, we don't just have a word of prayer, folks. We really pray. And we earnestly pour out our heart to God for each other, for the congregation, and for the lost in the world. And so this is why, uh, one of the reasons why, we have the unity and the harmony that we do. 
the three preachers, we meet on a regular basis. Every week we get together on Tuesday for lunch. We, after we've had our lunch, we go back to the study, and we spend all afternoon a lot of times in talking over the needs, the problems, and then we study the Word of God together, we read a passage, and we pray. And again, we don't get in a hurry about our prayers. It doesn't matter what's doing. Sometimes people can wait, and oftentimes they do wait. And the secretary is instructed, don't bother us. It has to be an emergency, emergency, and I mean a serious one, if we are interrupted, because that is prime time for us, folks. Yes, it is. And it, it is important to us that we have that time together and that we spend that time together. So we talk over our programs. We pray together. We read together. Another thing that we do that is important and that brings the success that we believe we have is that we operate on the philosophy as uh, ministers, as preachers of the gospel, that we can learn from each other. Hollis mentioned a few moments ago I'm a little bit senior to some of these younger fellows here, but that doesn't matter. Listen, I can learn and I have learned from Jeff Hill. I have learned from Steve Sykes, our youth evangelist. I can learn from anybody. I can learn something from anybody. And so I have never felt that there wasn't something that I couldn't learn from you. And I'm not ashamed to learn wherever there's something for me to pick up that will help me. I'm delighted for the opportunity. I don't care who it is taught by. These brethren help me, and I help them. And through this uh, interchanging process, why, of course, this is something that brings about the harmony and the unity that we have together. So I do learn from these, young, these men, and they, in turn, of course, appreciate what I am able to, to help them with. Another thing, we seek to understand the other's point of view. Now, we may not always agree on everything. I can tell you there are very few things that we disagree on. I can promise you that. But if we are not in complete on agreement on things, we listen. We listen attentively. attentively. We I can tell you there are very few things that we disagree on. I can promise you that. But if we are not in complete on agreement on things, we listen. We listen attentively. attentively. We hear each other out. And uh, if we uh, disagree, we make a point not to do it in a disagreeable manner. In other words, we are not obnoxious about it. And uh, I can tell you, as I said before, there are few, very few things on which we find disagreement because we make a point to work them out. And we feel that we can do just that. A sixth point that is important here to our success is that we are willing to sacrifice ourselves for the unity and the harmony of the church. I believe that is true of these brethren. I know that's true of Jeff Hill. I know that's true of Steve Sykes. And if I know my heart, I know that is the case. Now, we're ready to take it on the chin uh, if it is necessary so as to guarantee harmony and unity within the body. And I'm telling you what, we get some licks at times. Yes, we do. But that's all right. We've learned, you know, to just be flexible there and let it bounce a little and uh, take the reflex and uh, to go on. As Hollis was saying a few moments ago, we listen to our critics. There are things, folks, we can learn from our critics. And we need to listen to them. Now, there are times, obviously, when we are going to get unjust criticism. But it doesn't make any difference to me what kind it is. I am going to listen to it. Because I found out that sometimes people are telling me something I need to hear. And it may be the sort of thing that helps to keep me on track at times. So we should not be ashamed uh, to listen to our critics. That's, that's important, that's helpful, and I encourage you to do the same. Even if it is unjust, even if it is unfair, listen to your critics. There are things that we can learn from this. And you will grow and you will mature as a result of doing so. Another thing, as preachers, we always seek to build up our shepherds, our pastors, our elders. We build them up. We encourage them. We do it publicly. We do it from the pulpit. We do it in classes. We do it at uh, any public gatherings that we have. We take advantage of this, and we do it in their presence. We build these men up. We encourage them, and we seek to edify them in every way that we can. The members know that we love our elders, and I am sure that they understand that we love one another as evangelists. Uh, now, I might just point out here, you know, sometimes I get criticism of uh, Jeff and Steve. Let me tell you something. I'll listen to your criticism, but you just may as well bear in mind that when you're through criticizing Jeff, you've criticized me also. Because I love that man, and I believe in him, 
and I'm not going to uh, hear him criticized and turn around and criticize him in your presence. I refuse to do that. And he refuses to do the same with regard to me. We'll listen to your criticism, but we're not going to criticize one another in your presence. That we refuse to do. And that's one of the reasons why we have the harmony and the unity and that we are in agreement as we are. Uh, so we are supportive of one another. We make a point to support each other. Uh, the college group are very supportive of me, and I appreciate this. This jacket I'm wearing here that came from them. It didn't cost me a penny. And I appreciate that. I like that, you know, to know that they have enough concern. And I realize Jeff is behind all of that. He's the man, you know, who planted the seed. I don't know what else he planted, but I'm glad I have this jacket and I can wear it today, you know, and be grateful and thankful and tell you that we have a group of young people that have that kind of concern for the pulpit preacher. So we are supportive of one another. And as preachers, we, al we always seek to support each other and to build each other up as well as the leadership. We pray for one another, and we feel that this is very important. We have uh, dinners for the leadership. Just Thursday, I believe it was a week ago, the youth uh, evangelist and the young people had a dinner for the elders and their wives and for the preachers and their wives. Hey, that's great. That's good. The um, college group, they've done this for the elders, hasn't been but a short time ago, and for their fa families. That's remarkable. I think it's tremendous, you know, to have a relationship like that, where that uh, it's obvious that everybody uh, really does love and, and uh, supports the leadership, and they deserve that kind of uh, appreciation. They really do. Now then, just for a couple of minutes here, I want to talk about some areas where improvement can be made. And I'll have to get over this quickly, but I want to touch on it because these are things that we need help with. Brethren, we need to be flexible. And I'm telling some of you that you need to be more flexible than you are now. And a little less regimentation. As the campus, campus evangelist, and I'm talking to you fellows uh, now uh, for the most part, you should feel free to make change in your program, to adjust your methods in whatever way is necessary to best get the job done in your community. You should not feel tied to any program just because it is successful in some other area. It might not be as successful in your area, so you need to be flexible. And uh, that flexibility should reach over into whatever area is essential. And I'm going to mention some things right here. And mind you, uh, I hope you'll understand that I'm not being critical of anybody. I'm trying to get you to see the point that I'm getting at. When it comes to the matter of your devotionals on Friday evening, if that isn't the best time to have the devotional in your community, have it on some other night. Uh, sitting on the floor during the devotional. All right, whoever said that we have to sit on the floor everywhere? You know, some people may not like that particular custom, that, uh, that habit. So don't feel that it, everywhere you go and start a new ministry, you have to sit on the floor while you're having a devotional. And don't feel that you have to have a carpet to sit on. You may not be able to afford a carpet. And so if it isn't appropriate, don't feel that you can't have a ministry if you don't have a carpet to sit on. <laughs> or dating. Don't feel that you have to to have the dating exclusively on one day of the week, and it happens, happens to be Saturday or Saturday evening, you know. Uh, so far as your soul talks are concerned, I know now that you call them Bible talks. At least I think that's pretty well true, uh, as I've caught on. You know, I don't see anything wrong with the word soul talk. So far as I'm concerned, that is a scriptural term. Jesus said, uh, what would a man give in exchange for his soul? And so from my point of view, it's scriptural to talk about the soul. And I believe soul talks are scriptural. But if it's more appropriate to call it something else by some other name, if it's going to be offensive to people, all right. But don't you change it just because somebody else needs to in another area. I don't feel that's necessary. And that we have to go along and do everything just alike. That's the thing I'm saying, that we can be and we should be flexible. Take the business of prayer partners. I think that's a great idea. I think it's a wonderful thing. But there are some people who don't like that terminology. All right, if calling it something else, if buddy system works better in your area, what's wrong with calling it buddy system? Go on and pray. Go on and get together. Go on and have your sessions. Call it the buddy system if people are afraid of the other terminology. Don't you see what we're saying? Be flexible. Have some flexibility about what you're doing. And let me tell you something else. Now, I'm, you know, I told you I'm going to get right down to things that I think can help us. Students should not be marked. 
labeled or isolated just because they don't see everything the way that you do and the way we do. As the brother said in the previous session, we have international students among us and a lot of them, and we're reaching a lot of them at Indiana University. You know, they have some methods and some ideas and some cultural things that uh, are different from ours, and so they don't see everything just like we do. Don't feel like you have to, uh, to bring them around and twist them into the program to adjust to every little thing. Now, I'm not talking here about doctrinal things, the matters of faith. This isn't what we're dealing with at all. I think you understand that. But I am talking about methods and so forth, methodology and that kind of thing, opinions and what have you. And so it isn't necessary that we all have total harmony and agreement in that area. It's great if we can, but we won't always have. And if we seek to do that, it will uh, obviously hurt our program. Students should not be pressured or made to be, feel guilty or sent on a guilt trip if they do not, cannot, or fail to participate in everything that you have in your program. If they're unable to be there for a Bible talk, if they're unable to attend uh, your Friday evening devotional or whenever you have your devotional, uh, if they're unable to participate in your uh, playtime, if they don't choose to have a prayer partner, hey, don't look upon them as, they're, as if they're second-rate uh, Christians. Treat them properly. They deserve that. And they may uh, be the ones who need it the most, you see. If they're unable to participate in all of this and attend everything because their studies, their class activities make it impossible and simply because sometimes they choose to do something else, don't you uh, uh, cut off your fellowship with them. You be understanding of those people and realize that uh, they need your help and show them that you care and that you want to help wherever is possible. The fact that people do have problems uh, shouldn't cause us to isolate them and shut them out of our fellowship. They really are, are the ones that we should be reaching out to the most and doing everything that we can to help them. Uh, our students coming from Christian colleges, we're having some problem with this, brethren, in our programs. I know we are, and I hear it from different areas, and so that's why I want to just briefly touch on it. In these, these students oftentimes insist on more flexibility in the program than uh, some of us are uh, willing to have and a little greater freedom. Let's not accuse them of being uncommitted, uh, of having a bad attitude just because they don't uh, participate in everything that we have going. You see, they have a little different situation. Their homes are there, their families are there. And so that they don't have the same situation as the student who is on campus and away from home and away from family. There are different needs there. So realize that and take that into consideration. <clears throat> Just a couple of areas of caution. Boy, I've got to hurry here to get Jeff on, but if he runs over a little bit, I'm sure you won't mind because, uh, listen, this is important, folks. We're talking about areas where we're having uh, some real serious problems today and division in congregations and in the church. Uh, this again is directed to you campus ministers, you campus evangelists. Watch, these are some areas of caution. Watch about picking out one or two elders and making that your favorite. Now I understand what is being done here at times. I know you can't work with everybody to the same degree, but watch about that. About picking out one or two to the neglect of the others. Calling on this person at your retreats, your workshops, to do talks, to lead in prayer. While uh, essentially, you don't mean it that way, but that's what's happening, you're ignoring the rest of the leadership, the rest of the elders. If you want uh, jealousy to arise and if you want problems to arise, that's a good way. Watch that. Be careful about that. Watch about using your preacher as an afterthought in retreats and workshops and special events. Let me tell you, it's better not to use him at all, not to call on him at all, uh, if you only do it as an afterthought, he isn't crazy. He's not dumb. If he is, you shouldn't have him in the, in the pulpit in the first place, you see. <laughs> he does have feelings. Don't forget it. He does have feelings. Keep that in mind. And another thing, watch about guarding the teaching program and feeling you know that there's nobody else in the congregation qualified to teach the students but you. Use those people who are capable of doing that. After all, these, these students aren't always going to be under your tutelage in your ministry. Four years or less or a little more and they're going to be out and gone. It's going to be quite a shocking adjustment for them 
if you're the only one they've been exposed to in addition to the pulpit preacher. Watch about that. And uh, another thing, watch about encouraging the students if they have problems and needs just to come to you and to avoid the leadership. This has been done at times, but this is a dangerous thing. Be careful about that. Well, I could go on, but I must stop. <laughs> but I hope these things will help you some as you enter the ministry or as you continue your ministry where you are. I'd like to turn your Bibles to Romans chapter 12. I'm going to address probably all of my comments to those of you who are either in the campus ministry right now or, or training to go into the campus ministry in the near future. Um, verse 18, Paul says, If possible, as far as it depends upon you, live at peace with all men. Uh, there have been some things that we in the campus ministry have been criticized for, uh, sometimes justly, sometimes unjustly. But, uh, and there's, there's, there have been some situations that some of us have gone into, and there will be some that you will go into. You do have a difficult situation with the preacher you've been uh, put in the situation with or with your elders. But as far as it depends upon you, this scripture says, you live at peace with all men. Okay? And there's some things, so we're just going to talk to us right now, okay, uh, about some things that we can work on. Um, the congregation will know... Uh, your unity. They, they will know the unity that exists among the leadership. You and the preacher, you and your elders, and they will reflect that, that uh, unity. The congregation and uh, their unity will be a reflection of the unity in, in your leadership. And uh, it's so important. I, I felt when I went to Bloomington that probably my most important relationship, and I still feel this is true, my most important relationship other than my wife was with, was with Oliver. He had been there nine years as the evangelist. He was very well respected. Uh, and uh, if I would have gone in there and just uh, felt like I had all the answers and I had nothing to learn from him, uh, that would have been a big mistake. You know, I didn't even know it at that time. I found out since that uh, Oliver taught Jerry Jones uh, how to knock doors up in Chicago. And they were very close. And if I would have gone in there and, uh, and if Oliver and I would have had a bad relationship and things would have torn up and then, uh, you know, he... he uh, I was talking with Jerry sometime, and, and, and then Jerry gets a bad attitude, and then Jerry's the Bible chair to, uh, head down at Harding and all the influence he has. So it's, it's very important, the relationship you have with your preacher. You need to realize that uh, and, and, and make time to be together with your preacher and with your elders and make it a priority. And don't feel like spending time with your preacher or with your elders is a waste of time and thinking, man, I could be out there on the campus uh, having three Bible studies and here I am talking with my, my preacher for three hours on Tuesday afternoon. Uh, there will be other time you can make to do that, but make time to be with your preacher and your elders and make it a priority. I get with Oliver every week and get with Hollis every week as well as with, with some of the elder, other elders from time to time. As Oliver said, we can learn from each other and, and don't go into it with the attitude that there's yeah, there's probably a couple of things I can learn from my preacher, but there's about 98 things he can learn from me. Uh, there's a lot that you can probably learn from your preacher and your elders. Now, like I said, Oliver had been there a long time before I ever got there, and uh, there's a lot of things that I uh, could learn from him and I have learned from him. Uh, you need to be open with your preacher and with your elders. Uh, be open with them about struggles that you're going through. Be open with them about victories you're seeing in your ministry and in your life. Uh, don't be so, so stupid to think that, uh, that they think you never have struggles. They're, they're smarter than that. And so might as well be open and, and uh, share your struggles with them. It will only draw you closer. Seek their advice. Seek their advice on uh, activities, on, on problems. Uh, keep them informed. And this is uh, something that we've got to do as campus ministers. Keep them informed on activities that you're planning. Uh, keep them informed on needs. Sometimes uh, I've heard campus ministers complain because their preachers don't really preach to the needs of the congregation, especially to the needs of the campus uh, students. Uh, is it because we're not keeping them informed on what the needs are? Why not go, you're preaching, you're talking, you're praying together, and you say, brother, our, our students are just really having a problem uh, with, some of them are really having a problem with their, with their discipline. Some of them are just really not motivated to get out there uh, on, and, and, and talk to people about Christ. 
or some, maybe they're having a problem really motivating themselves to study in their classes. Uh, communicate uh, the needs. Keep them informed. Keep them informed on non-Christians that you're studying with. Who, the, who you want them to be praying for. See, that way, what you're doing, you're drawing them into your ministry. Sometimes we complain because they're not more of a part of our ministry. Is it because we're not drawing them into our ministry? So you share with them who's, who's getting close to becoming a Christian. That way, when he preaches a sermon, he sees them come forward. Uh, he's had a part in that. He's been praying for them. Those elders have been praying for them. And they're going to get up there and meet them as soon as they're baptized. Uh, so draw them into your ministry. Uh, share with them, uh, keep them informed on which Christians are really up and coming and which ones are really growing to be your leaders. Keep them informed on which Christians are really struggling. I uh, took an elder with me just about uh, a month and a half ago to go visit a couple of students who were very uh, close to falling away from Christ. And that not only let the elder see what, what I was having to deal with from time to time, but uh, that, that put a lot more clout into my visit. Okay? Because now an elder was with me, not just you know Jeff and his opinions, you know. So uh, take them with you, draw them into your ministry, uh, clarify misunderstandings quickly. You're going to have times when you misunderstand each other. Uh, don't just let those go by. Uh, clarify those as quickly as possible. Always treat uh, your leaders with respect. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 1 and 2 talks about treating the older men uh, as fathers. Uh, and I don't, uh, I don't uh, talk with Hollis about something that he might need to work on in his life the same way I would talk to one of the brothers that I'm training for the ministry. And I always treat them with respect. Uh, <clears throat> this is something that I think, feel is very important. Invite constructive criticism and admit when you're wrong. You're not always going to be right. Uh, that may be a revelation to you, but you're, you're, you're going to make mistakes. You're going to be wrong sometime. Uh, admit it when you're wrong and invite constructive criticism. When the, uh, re Just recently, in an elders meeting, I told the elders, after I'd preached a sermon, many of them had come up and complimented me on it, thanked me for it. Uh, I, th I told them in the meeting the next night, I said, I appreciate so much your, your encouragement and your thankfulness. And I said, I, I also want to know your correction. I want your criticism of my, of my preaching. I have not received any. But at least I let them know that I, I'm open to that. Okay? And when they do give you criticism, don't get huffy and defensive about it because they're going to think twice next time about giving you criticism. They're going to think, boy, you know, last time I said something to Jeff, he just really got defensive and prideful about it. I, I think I'll just not say anything. And you need that criticism to perfect you and to mature you. Okay? Um, Hollis touched on this, but pray with your leadership regularly and often. And you keep after them until you get that time to, to pray with them. Okay? Pray with them regularly and often. Let me just meet, mention briefly and kind of in closing, and then we'll try to give you a chance to make any comments or ask any questions if you'd like. Uh, a few enemies of working together as partners in the gospel. One is pride. Proverbs says pride goes before destruction. And we are not to think that if we're prideful uh, that, we're above that, uh, that we're above that scripture in any way. If we're being prideful uh, and not humble and open and teachable to, from our elders, our minister, uh, it will eventually destroy us in one way or another. Uh, another one is jealousy. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, I've, I've detected an attitude at times from some of us who've gone out into the ministry uh, that uh, we'll go out and we'll really show them in this congregation. You know, it hasn't been that effective. Uh, they haven't been winning that many souls, so we're going to show them that we've got the answers, we've got uh, the tools, and we're going to get the job done. And, and we go in there, and we are. We're effective. And we start converting people. Now, put yourself in that preacher's shoes, brothers. If you had been in that congregation for four or five years or ten years or fifteen years, and maybe the congregation really hadn't jailed, they hadn't really uh, won that many souls, and so on, and all of a sudden some guy half your age comes in and he starts just converting people left and right and making disciples, don't you think you'd have a tendency, regardless of how spiritual you might be, to feel a little bit threatened by that, maybe to be a little bit jealous? 
And sometimes I think we've gone in there hoping that we could be so effective we would even make the preacher feel guilty and jealous. That's the wrong attitude. We need to go in there uh, and put ourselves in his shoes and give him uh, credit for anything you can give him credit for. Draw him into your ministry so he feels a part of it, not threatened by it. Okay? Uh, Competition. Competition uh, is an enemy to really working together effectively. You know, Ronald Reagan, regardless of whether you believe in his uh, uh, economic policies and his politics and all this, uh, he's done some pretty amazing things. He's accomplished some pretty uh, amazing things in his first year and a half as president. And you know, he has a quote on his desk. It says, there are no limits to what a man can do if he doesn't care who gets the credit. And I believe that's something for us to live by as campus ministers. Don't feel like you have to get all the credit for everything. Okay? Competition is is an enemy. Uh, Comparison. Kind of goes along with this, but uh, don't let the congregation compare you. Oh, I like your preaching a lot more than the preachers. Why don't you preach more often? You know, uh, you know, you're you're a better teacher than he is. You you smile more. You wear nicer clothes. Uh, don't let them compare you to the preacher, to the elders, to the youth minister. And you can stop that. You can say thank you. I appreciate that. But I tell you what, you know, he's really growing in his ability to preach or his ability to teach. You can say something positive. Always speak about them in a positive way, never a negative way. Um, resentment is an enemy. Uh, sometimes we go in and we blame our preacher for lack of fruit in our ministry. And that may, it might hinder it to some degree. But if we're studying with people, if we're loving them, if we're teaching them the truth, uh, we're still going to convert people to Christ. Don't blame them for lack of fruit because that will only cause resentment. Uh, it's been said before, but uh, I think one of the key words for us as campus ministers is the word patience. We've got to learn to be patient. Don't uh, expect things to change overnight in that congregation. Okay? Uh, I'd like for us to give you an opportunity to, to ask questions or make some comments or observations. Okay, uh, Hollis? Yes, I'd like to say one more thing. Uh, I just want to retract one thing. Jeff didn't really come to Bloomington in a cowboy hat and boots. Uh, I'd just like to say before the end, without, without being prideful or boasting, that there's no one that I've been a member and been involved in the church for 40 years, and there's one, no one that I have more respect for, for Oliver Rogers. And I think you agree with, after hearing him tonight, this, the sincerity that he has and the love that he has for the college program, for all programs of church. And I know you're all shaking your heads back there. And as an elder, I have that same feeling. Uh, it's my prayer that there'll be a college program on every campus in the United States in my lifetime. And to do that, I hope we'll incorporate a lot of things we said today. And I had Jeff turn around and don't listen. Uh, I've, as I say, 40 years in the church, and I've never met yet a young man who has the love for the lost, who has the spirituality, who has the, uh, who's not prideful, who doesn't have an ego, that can work with an older man like Oliver, who is just one of the most splendid young men, and we're thankful to God that he came to Bloomington, Indiana. Thank you. Anybody have any comments or questions they'd like to ask uh, to myself or Oliver or Hollis? Okay. In our ministry, we've been going for about two years. The congregation we chose was one that was already being fruitful, evangelistic. The fellowship was fantastic. Everybody loves everybody. And after a while, when our our campus work started growing, and I'm not saying the campus work affected the church as a whole, but the evangelism began to decline as ours went up. And I, in speaking with, with our pulpit evangelist, uh, very, in a very friendly manner, just as good friends, I seem to sense a lot of resentment coming from you, but I don't really feel that the congregate of the, uh, the youth or the campus work was critical of anything in the church that would make the church start to go unevangelistic. 
how now I'm on the staff with him as an intern, and I'm wondering how can I uh, encourage him in this unity that you guys are talking about. How can I encourage it among the core staff members now? Now that there seems to be problems in, in, in that area, not that there are problems with the church as a whole or anything split or anything, but just I'd like to encourage him uh, towards the motivation of the congregation as a whole, because he has such a fantastic input. How do you do that? Y'all couldn't hear him back there, right? Uh, the question was, how do you, how, once you're in a situation that the leadership is not really unified, how do you, how do you build that? Well, I hope that's what this class was all about. Uh, but uh, I think um, you know you can get the tape of this class for one, and 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 y'all listen to it together, and just sit down. And I think uh, a lot of these things we've been talking about, and, and letting him know that uh, uh, you want that, and you feel like it's necessary. Uh, anything you can do to change, you want to do it, and you want to know from him anything you can change. Uh, and I think first we got to have that attitude that we're, we're open to correction and so on. But uh, I think just putting these things into practice, uh, letting them know you appreciate them, praying with them, uh, spending time together, and then that time doesn't necessarily have to be time when you're talking about problems in the church or activities. Uh, Hollis and I go play golf once in a while. Uh, different things, but uh, building relationships. I think that's that's got to be the key, and uh, it does have to be a two-way. But you may have to give 95 percent first <laughs> before you get five percent back. The reason I ask, I, mean, I understand we covered that in the class. I've gained so many things by being in here, but I feel very minute in a situation that looks so like it would take years to to, uh, to get going on the right track. You know what I mean? Well, it it might take a long time, but a little leaven leavens the whole lump, you know. <laughs> Go ahead, I'll, I'll stand up here where everybody can hear it. But I would just, I think we've clearly covered these things, but what I would say is, first of all, love him, show him respect, seek his advice, and don't uh, be reluctant in going to him for counsel. And uh, then you will get him thinking that he's the one who's really putting the uh, initiative in there, and when in reality you are coming behind, from behind and giving him a push and he doesn't realize it. Yeah, Rich? One thing that uh, ties in with the thing what you're talking about is a situation, say, where maybe the wives of the leadership have to work together on the other side. I've seen that being very destructive in some cases. Do you have any pointers for helping wives get together? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mm. Well, that's another class. <laughs> yeah, that's the next hour. Huh? <laughs> no, uh, I, I think. I think one thing you can start doing is is get together as couples. They might not. They might have some personality conflicts, but if y'all can do things, say uh, the council minister and his wife, with the preacher and his wife, or with an elder and his wife, have them to dinner, uh, go to a, a play together, different things. Uh, I think that's very, very uh, a good start. Anyway, uh, they're going to have to put in some of the same principles that you're putting in with the with the preacher or the elders. If you could share with them these principles. Uh, with uh, those elders' wives and, and let them know that uh, there's some things that, that they can and want to learn from the elders' wives or the preacher's wife. Okay, anything else? Appreciate very much your uh, attention and uh, pray that these things will help you in your ministries. God bless you.